Okay, folks, uh, welcome again to anybody online and anybody who will be watching this later on. Uh, blessings to you as well. And just so you're aware, I am aware of the time and we're not going to be having a long message. So it's all right, lunch is still planned. All good. So, I was actually just uh, praying into this message this morning. And it's, it's something that in some ways I think it was God speaking to me at first. And then I realised it was to go beyond. And it's that concept of we talk about our relationship with God. And our relationship with God is, by definition, a relationship. In other words, there's two parties involved, but they are not equal. And that's important to note, they are not equal. One is Lord and one is not. I'll give you a hint. He's called Lord and Saviour, so you can probably work out where you fit. The same as me. Let's just say it's definitely silver medal only. We're not on the top of the podium. And so the question then goes, as we push into discipleship, because we're not just about converts. Yes, we want converts, don't get me wrong. Of course we want people saved. But to tick people off as just being saved and then leaving it at that isn't, I don't believe, what God calls us to do. He calls us into discipleship. And so, what does that look like? And hence my comment, are you, am I, are we desperate for him on his terms? In other words, is he actually Lord or not? And that's something all of us have to fight all the time because that's, it seems to be in the human nature that Let's just say, sometimes we, we, we're desperate for him. But we don't necessarily want to die to everything that that involves. I'm just going to pick out two or three scriptures that I think highlight that desperation, what it can look like for us. This is the story of Hannah, 1 Samuel 1, verses 6 to 10. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. I want you to think about that. This is not short term. This is a long time. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. I want you to think about this. Hannah was the second wife here of Elkanah. She doesn't have children. This is an era when, other than being obviously a woman of the Lord, your identity was very much in marriage and having children. You were actually considered that there was at least something wrong with you, there was a sin, if not cursed, if you could not have children. So here she is, it says here the rival, the other wife, is having children. Year after year, it says, Hannah uh, cannot conceive. And it's not just that, she then gets hammered about that. 
year after year. But what does she do? The desire is still in her heart, because I'd argue God put that there. She wanted to be a mum. But she didn't let bitterness get involved. She actually just kept pressing in. Lord, if I don't understand, it actually, in the end, yes, I'm still hurt, but I will trust you. I will keep turning up year after year. I will still get irritated by the other wife. I will still turn up not understanding, Lord, why you haven't answered the prayers of the previous years, but I will still turn up and trust you. Yes, I'm out of my comfort zone. I don't understand, Lord. It's not my timing. I've prayed everything, but, Lord, I hand it to you. And I will still come to the temple and I will kneel before you. She's desperate. She's desperate. If we actually read on in this, Eli actually accuses her of being drunk as well. So she cops another whack before you know, there's any resolution. But she's just prepared to press in. She won't walk away. It's really interesting. We know the success of this continued pressing in. Of course, she does conceive. And what I love about that is, with little Samuel, is it's not one of those, Lord, thank you very much, now I'm off to just enjoy the fruit of the prayer. She dedicates him to the Lord. Because ultimately, for Hannah, it was always about the Lord. Even her greatest heart's desire in the flesh, which was to have a child, was still under the covering of the Lord. That's what being desperate for God is. It's actually being prepared. It's being prepared to accept that there can be pain in the offering. It's trusting him even when it doesn't make sense. It's having that relationship with him and knowing he's there and that is all you need. You need his presence. That's all you need because he's Lord, you can trust him. Mary of Bethany, I'm reading now from Matthew 26 into the New Testament. Verses 6 to 10. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. I want to take you back. Just imagine you're in that room, you can smell the, the perfume. You hear, some scholars argue that it's probably about at least half a year, if not up to a full year's salary was in this jar. We are talking serious money here. This smell is just permeating the room. But here's this woman. First of all, she's a woman. She's not considered equal. Remember the testimony in the Old Testament, the testimony of women wasn't accepted the same as some men. So she's there and she's come into this gathering and she's desperate. 
She can see the eyes. She knows what's happening. She's getting this out and she can see all the eyes just peering at her. She gets this jar out. And yet, it doesn't stop her. She breaks the jar, the seal on that jar, and she pours the oil. See, she's not worried about what the disciples are going to say. Because actually it was all about him. It was all about him. She didn't need a commentary from the world. She didn't need a commentary from anyone else. She just needed a commentary from the Lord. And she got it. She has done a beautiful thing to me. See, it was, she was sold out for him. It was on his terms. The cost didn't matter to her. A year's salary. Because she trusted him. She knew he provides. It was all about his heart. Because it was a personal relationship with him. He was the one who is Lord and Saviour. And the sad thing was that it was actually disciples who got it wrong when you think about it. Do you notice the first line? While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, you might have thought the disciples would have worked it out before they started. He was in the home of a leper. It actually shows the heart of God. See, Jesus didn't care either about what the world said. He was about the Father's love. It's about being desperate. Desperate for God. I want to now take you to the upper room. That's not the one we've got out in the hallway. I'm talking about the other one. 2,000 years ago. Luke 24, verse 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. It's a verse that we often read, but I, I sometimes think we, we pass over it fairly quickly. These disciples, remember, they ended up in the upper room in fear because they were worried about reprisals, potential execution, persecution, all of that. That's why they were up there and then Jesus comes among them and he, they've, they've had that experience. They know he's alive, he's resurrected. And then he says something that to them must... We think it's fine, we know all about Pentecost. They didn't. You've got to put yourself back here. They had no idea about Pentecost at this point. And then he says, I'll send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here. So A, they don't know what that really looks like at that point. And they have to stay. This, remember, this is just after a whole crowd shouted, crucify him. And now Jesus is saying, stay and wait. He doesn't say how long. Remember that they had been with Jesus for around three years in ministry. Maybe they're going to have to wait for three years. They don't know. All they know is every moment they wait, they know that Jewish authorities want to shut down this sect they know the Romans would rather crush anything else now. They might have, they've stirred it up anyway and crucified Jesus. Might as well just finish the job, get rid of it. At least then they've got peace and they don't have to worry in their Roman Empire. That's the situation these guys are in. And Jesus says, wait. So what's waiting look like? Do I go back 
you know, do I really get the business going again, the fishing business going? What's weight look like? And I'm not talking about just how do I feed myself for a week. I mean, as in longer term, what's it look like? And yet these guys were so sold out that they did. They followed his instructions. They were prepared to risk whatever it took, be it persecution, death, whatever. Why? Because he said, stay here until the Holy Spirit comes. They were sold out, totally. Even though it would not have made sense to them, they trusted. I'm just going to finish with one last scripture. I'm going back now to Psalm 51. So we're moving back. This is David's response, and I think David just points us in that same path of discipleship. Remember, this is David after he's sinned with Bathsheba. He's gutted. And then he prays, Lord, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me. No, it's the Lord who has to do it. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Note that it's the Lord who has to hide his face because we can't get rid of sin. Only he can wash us clean. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In the end, it's he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's no in between. It's all about him. It's all about him.